This video is similar to a video I recorded a couple of years ago, but several questions were asked in the comments that I wanted to answer, add additional detail as well as improve the audio and visual quality of the video. But before I go any further, many people have reached out and asked how they can help support the new Gospel Learning app and gospellearning.org website. If you don't know what these are, please watch the intro video as the app is meant to be a trusted resource for members of the LDS Church to use to get answers to questions on thousands of different topics, including difficult ones, from the best teachers in the church. Donations have made gospel learning a reality, and we have set up a Patreon page for those that want to donate some money to keep the project going. The link is here or down in the description below. Or you can also click on the Donate menu in the app. With your help, we plan to continue to add new content each week as well as new features and upgrades. With each donation, you have the gratitude of the gospel learning community, and you will earn a special badge that you will see in your profile that are unique to donors. Check out the app if you haven't. More than anything, we're trying to raise the level of gospel understanding, and we hope you use this free app as we try to grow and share the gospel together. So back to the two witnesses. Scripture speaks of two special people called two witnesses who will have such a strong faith and power that they will cause many of the miracles and plagues to come about as described in the book of Revelation. But who are these individuals? Are they living now? And what exactly will they do? Revelation 11.1 1 begins with John being given a, quote, reed like unto a rod, and he is asked to measure the temple of God. It is likely that John saw something like this. It is a stick made out of reed and comes from this Greek word which is translated canon. We refer to the scriptures as canon because they are laws by which we should measure our lives. John is then told to rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. This is referring to the three and a half year period just prior to Christ's return to the Mount of Olives where he saves the Jews after Armageddon. Beginning in Revelation 11.3, it speaks of these two witnesses who will be given power to prophesy for 2,260 days, which is three and a half years. So verse 2 describes Jerusalem being under siege and then two witnesses protecting it during that time. Notice that they are given the power and authority to prophesy to an entire nation during that time, a privilege only given to prophets. I'm not talking about the prophet of the church, but rather more one general distinction of a prophet, seer, and revelator, which many can hold at the same time. This was such an important question to Joseph Smith that he asked about who they were and received a direct revelation which is found in Doctrine and Covenants 7715. In this unique question and answer section with the Lord, the Lord refers to them as prophets. He also gives more details when this will happen, as it will be after the Jews are gathered, after they have rebuilt the city of Jerusalem in the last days. This also gives us a clue as to who they are, as they will be, quote, raised up to the Jewish nation in the last days. But we'll come back to that. The timeline around the two witnesses is well defined in scripture. These two will prophesy to Jerusalem and protect them for three and a half years prior to Christ's return where he saves the Jews from annihilation, splitting the Mount of Olives. But that is not Christ's second coming in glory, where he comes wearing red and the wicked are burned and the righteous raised up and saved. This is confusing for many Latter-day Saints. I did a video specifically on the second coming and the times of the Gentiles being fulfilled where that is described in detail using scriptures and quotes from the apostles and prophets. The easiest way to find these videos is by using the free gospel learning app and search on second coming and select the video or any number of other videos on that subject, mostly by teachers that are far better than myself. Referring to the two witnesses, Isaiah called these prophets, quote, two sons, and said that they were the only hope of deliverance for Israel because they would be full of the fury of the Lord. Revelation 11.4 says that these two witnesses are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks. This is referring to Zechariah chapter 4, verses 11 to 14. This is where you can study further these symbols for yourself to come to your own conclusions. But my study leads me to believe that this discusses the two special individuals that will have the sealing power, which is what is described next in Revelation 11. 
Verses 5 and 6 of Revelation 11 describe some of their powers, including to destroy their enemies with fire and causing droughts and plagues. But who are these two witnesses? Bruce R. McConkie said of these two prophets, quote, No doubt they will be members of the Quorum of the Twelve or of the First Presidency of the Church. But I'm not so sure. Could there be hints of their identities found in the Scriptures? Back to Zechariah 4, notice in verse 14, he refers to these as the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord. Those that stand on the left and the right hand of the Lord is discussed in Matthew 20, where the mother of James and John asks if her sons may sit on the right and left hand of Christ in his kingdom. He answers that this isn't his to grant, but whom is prepared of my father? Zechariah talked about one on the left and one on the right, and if you look at the Hebrew, that can also mean north and south. Could one clue be that one would be coming from the northern kingdom of Israel while the other from the southern? Because remember, Doctrine and Covenants 77 said that they will be raised up to the Jewish nation. That doesn't sound like a current or future member of the Quorum of the Twelve to me. It also doesn't seem like future converted Jews, as these events must happen before the Jews accept Christ, although I know that there are a few Jews that have converted to our faith. So who could it be? Now this is all speculation, my own opinion, of of which I'm not even 100% convinced, but I think Doctrine and Covenants 6114 may be partially an answer for us, where it says, quote, Behold, I the Lord in the beginning blessed the waters, but in the last days by my mouth of my servant John I cursed the waters. Notice here that John isn't just the biblical writer of the last days narrative, but actually the one that curses the waters. Could John the Revelator actually be one of the two witnesses? Some might say that the Lord is referring to the revelation of the plagues by John here and not him actually performing them, but I'm not so sure. It is true that this could be interpreted a number of different ways. In the Guide to the Scriptures about John, it says that John has an important work to do during his time in the earth and in the New Testament times and in the last days. Why would it say this unless John was to take an active role during the final events of the last days? It also says that John, quote, did not die, but was allowed to remain on the earth as a ministering servant until the time of the Lord's second coming. Coincidence? Remember the Lord promised in Matthew 16 that some standing there would not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in the kingdom. Is there someone else that this could be referring to other than John? John 21 talks about the one that will, quote, tarry until Christ's return. I find it interesting that the word tarry has a cross-reference, which says, And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. John is told that he will have to prophesy again. Could this be referring to him being one of the two witnesses? This is further described in Doctrine and Covenants 7, where Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery in 1929, using the Urim and Thummim, asked if John was allowed to tarry in the flesh and if he had died. It was revealed that he had been allowed to tarry and would have a greater work to do than what he had done. It says, quote, he has undertaken a great work and says that he will make him a flaming fire and a ministering angel. Very similar language of that described in the two witnesses. You can also read more about this in 3 Nephi 28 verses 6 through 12, where the three Nephites are given the power to tarry, and Christ compares their desire to the same that John the Beloved had. And no surprise, John is Jewish and raised up to the Jewish nation. But this leads to the biggest question that I received in the comments in an earlier version of this video. Many people said that the two witnesses will be killed at the end of the three and a half years, and translated beings can't die. I should have anticipated this question and answered it, and so I apologize. We know that translating beings do not experience pain or death like the rest of us, but we shouldn't assume that they will never face death. In the Guide to the Scriptures, it says that they won't die, quote, until their resurrection to immortality. That can be interpreted a few different ways, but it may be that those that are translated at the end of their missions are allowed to die. Now, if John is one of the two witnesses, it is prophesied that he will die just before he is resurrected, so I think that could count. Revelation 6, verses 9 through 11 says something really interesting. It says, quote, And he had opened the fifth seal. I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they had. 
And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also, and their brethren, that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. So John, who is getting this revelation, is seeing the early apostles asking how long it will be before Christ comes in judgment. And he says they need to wait a little season until their fellow servants and also their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Well, John is likely the only remaining member of the early 12 apostles when the revelation was given that had not been killed. Or if there were others, they were killed shortly thereafter. And God is saying that he also, John, needs to be killed before Christ can come in glory. Again, who the two witnesses are is purely speculation. But if John could be one of the two witnesses, then who would the other one be? Well, it wouldn't be Peter or James or anyone else from the New Testament as they were all killed. It seems clear that it would have to be a mortal or a translated being. When you think about John being held back and translated so he could perform this work, you have to ask yourself, who else has been translated that could fill this other spot? There are the three Nephites, but they are not Jewish, nor is their responsibility to those in Jerusalem. Plus, there are three of them. There is Moses, who was translated, but again, not Jewish. This is another question I got. What do you mean Moses wasn't Jewish? Moses was of the tribe of Levi, not Judah. Yes, he was an Israelite, which is oftentimes referred to synonymously with Jews, but he was not Jewish. There was Enoch, but he will be returning with the city of Enoch during the millennium, so it isn't him. There were other unnamed people who it says were translated, but they were caught up to the city of Enoch as well, so presumably they will return with Enoch. But there is a Jew that did have the sealing power and was translated. Elijah, one of my very favorite Old Testament prophets. You will remember the many miracles he performed, including calling down fire from heaven against the priests of Baal. The Bible is silent on Elijah's tribe. However, tradition is that he was a Jew, although he may not have been raised in the region of Judah, but rather in the northern kingdom. Could it be that Isaiah is talking about Elijah in Isaiah 41 verse 25? Quote, I have raised up one from the north, and he shall come. From the rising of the sun he shall call upon my name, and he shall come upon princes and upon mortar, and as the potter treadeth clay. Could this be talking about the other witness who clearly has unparalleled faith and the ability to control the elements? Could these princes be referring to Gog in the land of Magog in the last days? For more on this, there is a video about Armageddon. By the way, there may be a clue why no one from our dispensation was selected to be the two witnesses in Isaiah 41, verses 26 through 29, but I'll let you study that on your own. In the guide to the scriptures about Elijah, it says, quote, 1. Elijah ministered in the northern kingdoms of Israel. 2. He performed many miracles. 3. At his request, God prevented rain for three and a half years. Remember what it says in Revelation 11, these witnesses will shut the heavens that it will not rain during the days of their ministry, which will be three and a half years. And four, Elijah was the last prophet to hold the sealing power of the Melchizedek priesthood before the time of Christ. He, in fact, gave the sealing power to John at the Mount of Transfiguration, described in Matthew 17.3. This would make Elijah and John the last living individuals with the power prior to Joseph Smith. And five, all of this is in preparation of the second coming, and the Lord has spoken of in Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6. Perhaps Elijah's work described in Malachi 4, verse 5 goes beyond just passing the sealing power to Joseph Smith or speaking about temple work. Doctrine and Covenants 10 says, quote, After this vision had closed, another great and glorious vision burst upon us. For Elijah the prophet, who was taken to heaven without tasting death, stood before us and said, quote, Behold, the time has fully come which was spoken of by the mouth of Malachi, testifying that he, Elijah, should be sent before the great and dreadful day of the Lord come to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to their fathers, lest the whole earth be smitten with a curse. 
Not only does this confirm that Elijah never tasted death, but it also could be interpreted that at the point the gospel is rejected by the Gentiles, the earth will be smitten with a curse. There is another video on the times of the Gentiles, but Elijah's mission sure sounds like it goes beyond just confirming the sealing keys to Joseph Smith. Could this curse be the drought spoken of in Revelation 11 that the two witnesses will bring about? I hope not, because that will be a worldwide drought for three and a half years, and that doesn't sound fun. In fact, I wonder if part of the interpretation of the scripture that says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established, it isn't talking about the two witnesses spoken of in Revelation, for that is what will happen in Jerusalem in the last days, and the three Nephites being the three witnesses for Zion, the new Jerusalem in the last days. Just something to noodle on there. In fact, if you want something interesting to study, you should research the law of witnesses. Regardless of who actually ends up being the two witnesses, they will prophesy while keeping what is described in Joel 2.2 as the largest army ever assembled at bay during their three and a half year ministry. This is the latter day abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. This is also known as Armageddon. As you can see here in Daniel, the three and a half year period is mentioned again. This scene of bloodshed and devastation is described by several ancient prophets. I'll pause here if you want to write the references down to do further study yourself. Even our modern day prophets describe this as the final conflict before the Lord comes. Joseph Fielding Smith said, quote, One thing that we are given by these prophets definitely to understand is that the great last conflict before Christ shall come will end at the siege of Jerusalem. This is true as it is just before Christ saves the Jews on the Mount of Olives. Revelation 11, 5 and 6 describes how Israel is defended from these massive armies by the two witnesses. Quote, and if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven and it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Then, after three and a half years, the two prophets will be captured and killed by the opposing army, and their bodies will be left in the streets of Jerusalem for three days and a half, as the forces of evil engage in a great celebration over their death. The army then ravages the city with all of those that remain in it. Zechariah says that only one-third of the nation of Israel will survive this final extremity when the city shall be taken. Revelation 11, 11 and 12 describes what happens next. It says, And after three days and a half, the spirit of life comes from God entering into them. And they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven, saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Then at the moment Jerusalem and its inhabitants are about to be annihilated, the Lord's fury will be unleashed. This is the moment that Christ touches down on the Mount of Olives where it splits. An earthquake will strike the earth, affecting the whole world, the greatest earthquake the world has ever known. At the same time, many plagues that mirror those brought upon Egypt at the time of Moses happen again. As you can see, these two witnesses are part of the winding up scene as we approach Christ's millennial reign. Remember that when Christ saves the Jews, that is not Christ's second coming in glory, where everyone sees him at once and he's clothed in red apparel. That comes sometime later, after the one half hour of silence, which begins as these events wind up. During the half hour of silence, Jerusalem needs to be rebuilt, the temple rebuilt in Jerusalem by the Jews who are now converted after being saved by Christ. Remember that this is just my opinion, and none of this will get you into heaven. Please remember to download and use the Gospel Learning app, and please share it with friends and family, where you'll be able to watch videos on thousands of subjects by many of the best teachers in the church, certainly teachers that are far better than I. But thanks for watching.